Hammer of the Gods. Writings of Nietzsche. Edited and translated by Stefan Metcalf. Introduction. Quote, Even when the heart bleeds. Section 2. The Ecstasy of the Tragic Slash Self-Overcoming. Lighting lanterns against a sky washed orange by a new dawn. The blood of God fresh on our hands, breath coming in hoarse gasps, no longer ourselves. We begin to unpick the locks holding a gate marked catastrophe shut. Slipping all moorings and venturing out onto oceans of virtual death, standing once again in the foaming surf, breakers lapping around our feet, trembling in restless ecstasy, we are gradually inserted into a labyrinth a complex of little alleys and corridors, flattened into an infernal gaming table and marked with the name Nietzsche. Perhaps we have been here before. How easily we forget. The labyrinth of existence possesses an end, some kind of goal towards which life impetuously rushes, bracket, but never the end, close bracket. At the same time, it is plastic, mutable, and constantly shifting ground, such that there is no predetermined map, no territorial imperative, no transcendental domain attainable from which to assault the material singularities of overabundant existence. Drunk on the narcotic pessimism of Schopenhauer and Wagner, Nietzsche botched this insight in The Birth of Tragedy. In seeking to resolve the periodic, chaotic tendency to subjective dissolution in orgiastic festivals of self-destruction by means of mediating between two tra transcendental principles of homeostasis, marked with the names of Greek deities, Apollonian and Dionysian, dream and intoxication, the capture of intense experience in images. These two principles came together on the stage of Greek tragedy, bracket, or, in a point that would later make Nietzsche so nauseous, in the total art of Richard Wagner, close bracket, where fatalism runs along the line of a pre-established, irreversible chain of events, according to a divine project unknown to its victim, where the inner combustion of Dionysian ecstasy always ends up governed by Apollonian moderation. Transcendence has its foundations shaken, as the Principium Individuationis threatens to fall apart, but never fully collapses. Suffering, pain, and ecstasy swim in superficial seas, formed out of the accumulation of centuries of poetic dribbling. The infantile laments of born failures contain the Dionysian refrain, dazzled in the footlights, stage-struck, and drowned out in the cacophony where the voice captures the intensity of the dance. Nietzsche's later thought cuts the thought of the tragic-slash-fatal loose from its this-idealist representational grid. Tragedy hardwired to the transhistorical is flattened out onto a continual play of chance and necessity. Necessity which does not entail the abolition of chance. Necessity which becomes fatal when the dice thrown out against the future return to reveal their outcome. The singular number that is no other at once irreplaceable and multiple, coupled to a recurring innocence that continually wipes the slate of existence clean and affirms this drawing of lots, bracket, loos, equals fate, destiny, close bracket, even if the outcome is detrimental. Nietzsche's love of the philosophers of the future capable of gambling thus is profound. They know how to probe their depths, they have learned to love the result of this reckless experiment, quote, they admit to finding pleasure in the acts of negation and dissection, and to a kind of self-possessed cruelty which knows how to wield the knife with certainty and mastery even when the heart bleeds, close quote, beyond good and evil. Philosophers of the future ride currents of fatal multiplicity into an intensified, unresolved, uncertain climate, something like a new zone of, of the tropics, possessing no higher dimensions than those of its own flat, multiple field. God is dead, and any theory which preaches the attainment of any afterlife, a numbing, death-like paradise out of this world, judges against life and contaminates it with the basilisk of revenge responsibility, guilt. In the labyrinth, the self-possessed individual suffers the same bodily dismemberment as Dionysus, 
bracket, the singular name now marking the space-time of the tragic close bracket, in order to attain its multiple phase shifts, which lock onto courses stripped of any notion of personal responsibility. The enemy is no longer ecstasy, but redemption, all that scans the distance for a way out of the labyrinth. Dionysus goes to war with Christ, and life becomes a matter of navigating the labyrinth and all the minotaurs, bloodshed, and cremation it entails. Quote, life itself, its eternal fruitfulness and recurrence, is a matter of agony, destruction, the will to annihilation. Close quote. Notebook fragment. In order to overcome the potentially suicidal lure of a life stripped of purpose, Nietzsche no longer bets on the laws of thermodynamics which guarantee that energy will run down to the indifferent terminus of an equilibrium of forces. And neither does he attempt to heal all of life's wounds, boredom, and pain, bracket as Schopenhauer did, by means of a recourse to hope and pity neither of which will compensate for a life of suffering since, quote, the course of a man's life is, as a rule, such that, having been duped by hope, he dances into the arms of death, close quote, Schopenhauer. But all this is imaginary, an idea, all this hope, all this self-pity, life grasped as a beachhead in a storm, lashed by the savagery of the ocean, with only the self-deluded, brattish suffering of bourgeois poets for protection wailing at the cyclone for calm and order, suffering with nothing palpable to overcome, romanticism and pallid decadence, tears and purple flowers scattered on the graves of youth's murdered dreams, the tragic beauty of the exhumed corpse of that revolting plethora of sentiment, poetry. It is at this point that Nietzsche's it is at this point that Nietzsche's thought turns toward the question of the exercise of the will, a philosophy initially issuing from the pessimistic climatological zone delineated by Schopenhauer, where, quote, the will, considered purely in itself, is entirely devoid of knowledge. It is only a blind, irresistible urge, as we see it appear in inorganic and vegetable nature and in their laws, and also in the vegetative part of our own life, close quote. Schopenhauer. It is pure impulse, force, and not a political organization bent on the enslavement of all society under a dictatorship, bracket, as the most common and cretinous misreadings of Nietzsche would have it, close bracket. Nietzsche's main move beyond Schopenhauer is to cease to view the will as an object of revulsion, energizing a feeling of horror and pity at all that has been condemned to live, organically bind itself together, and reproduce, bracket, the will to live. Transvalued by Nietzsche, the primal will functions as an impulse for power, an essentially plastic, mutable, brutally materialist conception of a simultaneously motive and formative power, which synthesizes product modes of evaluation, enmeshing the will to live within itself. The will to power never overdetermines all that which it synthesizes. It operates on a plane of imminence which is never higher or wider than its field of application, bracket, all that which it operates upon, close bracket. It metamorphoses itself, slipping into every skin, always within this labyrinthine field. <clears throat> it metamorphoses itself, slipping into every skin, always within this labyrinthine field, determining itself along with all that it determines. It is completely irresponsible, a source of energy, the genesis of all actions, feelings, and thoughts. As raw impulsive force, it constantly exceeds the goals and targets set by whomever or whatever evaluates and synthesizes by means of it. It is always already modifying this goal and target, cutting away at the foundations of any continuous identity intended for it. The dissonance of the suicidal being dissolved in the consonant synthesis of the eternal return where past, present, and future converge and the individual will is abolished. Nietzsche is a catastrophe theorist, which is to say that processes which is to say that processes of synthesis and evaluation do not run down towards somnambulant equilibrium. They tend towards critical points, phase shifts, 
where the thick black ice holding the present fixed in place, the terminator on the surface of the planet marking the sunlit zones of enlightenment off from their dark areas, becomes fluid once more. Where the fixed zero degree of the Celsius scale is blasted by a solar wind howling across interplanetary space. Hammers crushing against prisons of walls of values held at equilibrated ice point. The hibernators awaken to throw evaluation back into streams of becoming. Gravothermal collapse hurls the fixed stars out of their cyclic orbits. Immense galaxies open up on the dark side, beyond the line of the Terminator, turning towards the chaotic manifold with a burst of belly laughter which counterweights the will to annihilation. Quote, Those were just steps for me. I have now climbed on over them. Therefore, I must have journeyed beyond them. But you thought I wanted to sit down upon them and rest. Close quote. Notebook fragment. Humanity continually goes over and across towards its own overcoming. The technics of its bridge building ensures this. Nothing can preserve it from this catastrophe. To trace the various speeds and velocities of this process, Nietzsche's method is to relate any concept coming under experimental scrutiny to the will to power and ask, who is it that wills this? What kind of drive reaches out to evaluate like this? From what mode of evaluation does this will radiate? And not just who wants power, bracket quantitative question, but what kind of power, bracket qualitative question. Is it masterful, active, self-affirming and tragic, bracket i.e. fatal, or slavish, negative and dialectical, bracket as we shall see later, close bracket, the will to the end. Countless luminous globes orbit in endless space, around which revolve a series of smaller illuminated bodies, hot at the core and covered with a gold crust. Hot at the core and covered with a cold crust, over which a moldy film is spread. The world, the real, ideas in the mind burning their imaginary laws onto the body of the earth, the movements of the stars, the dissipating heat of the sun. In the quaint nomenclature of 18th century astrophysics, quote, fixed stars hung like baubles in the night sky. Truth lay striated on the, quote, fact that they did not alter their position in the celestial sphere relative to the earthbound observer. Such stars acquired this name as a means of distinguishing them from, quote, wandering stars, stars which were permitted to move by the postulates of scientific reason, the planets. But the appearance of fixity is only a matter of distance. Bracket, sometimes things which appear to be close lie at an imperceptible point in the distance. Close bracket. Stars which lie far beyond their insignificant, stars which lie beyond our insignificant solar system, appeared to be fixed in space owing to the tremendous stretch of time necessary for their light to become perceptible. The light source did not seem to alter. A little more enlightenment and the scientific guardians of, quote, natural law know what has really been going on. They discover the, quote, proper motion of stars across the celestial sphere. A little changeling imagining the earth and the observer to be at the center of a sphere within which the positions of celestial bodies are plotted for the purpose of calculating the distance between them. Nothing moves. Nothing changes. Whoever thought that the earth orbits the sun? The thought of fixity is suddenly annulled in the, quote, knowledge of movement. After one of these catastrophes, the past can be accessed and transvalued. For wasn't this always so? Coming out of the neotropic hot zone of the phase space, is it not true that one merely lives before or after these events? Bracket, but still, news of the event takes so much time to arrive. The shadows still need to be erased from the wall. And so it is with humanity. The human already contains the principle of some kind of evolution beyond itself, the germ of some future maturation, the techniques to peel off all second skins. To the best of our scientific knowledge, the nature of humanity may appear to be fixed in place when measured against a false linear teleological calculus which freezes over becoming in being. It is a question of faith, faith in science, faith in God, faith in humanity, 
which orders the universe as if all this were true now and eternally. A permanent Copernican revolution, coding the horrifying apprehension of universal disorder in layer upon layer of human ideas which dictate their laws to nature. Human, microscopic meaning raised to the macrocosm. Bracket. For the slaves, telos, paradise. For the masters, terminus, death. Close bracket. Quote, we hold unities to be necessary in order to calculate but that is not to accept that these unities actually exist. We have balanced the concept of unity upon our concept of, quote, I, our oldest article of faith, close quote. Notebook fragment. Nietzsche's materialism reinvests calculus with chaos, counter-revolutionizing the Copernican revolution with ruthless, dehumanized, heliocentric fatalism which cuts away at the theologically sedimented bedrock of the transcendental subject. In this overabundant economy of active, solar excess, nothing is to be held accountable for itself in the general malaise of chaos, chance, and transvaluation, all of which strips the world of its thin, fragile, pessimistic shell and plunges it into an ever more profound depth of the impersonal, the inhuman. This solar force is the energy enabling all undertakings, not the desired f effect that prompts the cause of that effect by means of a reverse inference from the product to the idea that produced it. In the laboratory of this general economy of squandered wealth, reaching out beyond itself towards the unattainable goal of the overman, bracket, unattainable because to think otherwise would be to suppose a final destination, close bracket, quote, Humanity is really more of a means than an end. Humanity is merely experimental material, the monstrous surplus of bad breeding, a pile of rubble, close quote. Notebook fragment. Material which lives dangerously in the pursuit of yet more experiments.